Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to begin the last act of Macbeth. If you take a look at your screen, what I would like to do with you today is to uh, kind of focus on how Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's behavior um, tell us about this theme of ambition. So we're at the end of, uh, of the play, the last act, and we're going to see how the prophecies that Macbeth received from the witches allow him to continue to feel that he is um, undestructible. But then we're also going to go back to Lady Macbeth. We haven't seen her for a while, and I want us to look at this first scene of Act 5 and study how Lady Macbeth's character is really going on a spiral um, to the bottom, right? She's, uh, what she's done or what she's suggested to be done with King Duncan is really going to take a toll on her. Act 5, scene 1 is a very big contrast to the first scene where we saw Lady Macbeth and how she presented herself in the beginning. So what I want to do first is to have you take a look at your screen. I want to go over some of the vocabulary terms and some background information that we need before we begin the act. So you have here a couple of words like perturb, which means to disturb. You also have the word um, taper, which for Shakespeare's time it means candle. Um, it has changed its meaning over time, and if you take a look on your screen, the word more um, gradually has come to mean to, to taper someone off of medicine, for example, to gradually take someone out of something. But it really uh, comes from taper, which means uh, candle, to gradually diminish in size as it burns. And this is going to be important to scene one of act five. Um, fortify is to strengthen. Um, abhor is to hate or to detest. And then, if you take a look here, um, I'm giving you some background information on Greek mythology. Again, very important to our study of Shakespeare, particularly for Macbeth. And you have this Morai, which is the uh, three uh, three sisters, different than the three witches, although they, um, you know, they also provide. Uh, in the story some sort of supernatural power. But I'm going to show you a quick video that really explains the, the purpose of these three sisters. If you've ever watched the Disney movie Hercules, um, where you have uh, these three witches come and, um, and tell um, Hades about uh, Hercules' fate, and how they can um, they can kind of cut through a person's thread of life and end their life. This is what uh, the Mirai means. So I'm going to show you a quick video um, of this background information because it's really important to the end of the play. So let's take a look at that first, and then I'll bring you back to the literary terms for today. Clotho the Spinner. Lachesis the Allotter, and Atropus the Inevitable. Three names that might not mean a whole lot to most people, but these make up the three sisters of fate, the Morai, or the Mire, if you want the Greek pronunciation. The sisters were the children of Zeus and Themis, which does explain their gift of prophecy. They may not be the exact same thing as the oracles, but they played an important part in helping their mother decide the future of humanity. There is some discussion, however, of Nyx perhaps being the mother of the sisters, but Themis seems to be the goddess that most poets agree on. They controlled what was known as the thread of life. When man was created, they began to spin this thread. It would then be measured and cut which predicted someone's life from birth to death. It followed all of the steps they took, all the actions they made in their life, and all of the consequences that then followed. It was essentially a prophecy of every human life that was symbolized by pieces of thread. Once you reach the end of a thread, that symbolizes the end of that individual's life, and this was thought to be a very rigid system that could not be cheated nor changed unless you were Zeus, of course. His relationship with his daughters meant that he could extend or shorten the life of his allies and enemies. The Marai themselves would rarely intervene in human affairs, nor did they choose who died and how. 
humans still had the freedom to influence the details of their own death. The sisters of fate just knew when someone's time had come to an end. They were often accompanied by several deities and spirits, and using the laws governed by their mother Themis, they would assign the appropriate entity to one's death. If you were destined to die a gruesome death in battle, then they would send the Keres. If you committed crimes against humanity and the gods, then they would ensure that the Irinis were dispatched to inflict the correct punishment. And the same can be said for birth, as they were accompanied by Elithea, one of the goddesses of labour and childbirth. In terms of appearance, they can sometimes appear as young women, but most of the time they were more your stereotypical crones. Old, ugly hags who would be seen measuring and cutting the threads of life. Sometimes, all three sisters were shown with scepters and crowns, and other times they had varying trinkets from scales and sundials to wax tablets and scrolls. They were mentioned by numerous poets, and do feature in several stories outside of their main duties. They took part in the war between the giants and the gods, even killing two giants known as Thun and Agrius with bronze maces. Now this is something that I definitely found rather amusing. The image of three elderly women who could barely walk, beating giants to death with maces that they could probably just about carry. There is also some mention of the Morai in relation to Typhon. When Zeus was in pursuit of Typhon, the Morai deceived him by offering him fruit that would make him stronger. The fruit, of course, had no effect, and did nothing but buy Zeus the time needed to find Typhon. One of the few times that we see the Morai intervene in the affair of mortals is at the command of Hera, who orders them to stop Heracles being born. With aid from Elithea, Heracles' mother Alcamenae is stuck in an endless birthing process, However, Alcimene's midwife, Galantheas, visits the Morai, telling them that it is the will of Zeus that Heracles must be born. This distracted them long enough for Heracles to be born, but the midwife would pay quite a steep price for deceiving the gods. The sisters transformed her into a weasel for her deceit, but this wouldn't be the end of the punishment. In order to mate, she would have to be mounted through the ears, and she would give birth through her throat, essentially vomiting out children. Quite a grotesque punishment, and one which shows the Marai should not be trifled with. But I guess you also have to give it to them for creativity. It also wasn't all bad for the midwife turned weasel, as the goddess Hecate took pity on her, and made her one of her sacred followers. The Marai are this interesting combination of prophecy, life, and death. They have an extremely important role that other deities may not necessarily be trusted to perform, and for the most part, they do remain impartial. Okay, so that kind of gave you some background information on this Greek mythology. Again, very important to Act 5 of Macbeth. The last thing that I want to go over with you before we begin today are some literary terms. So if you take a look on your screen, you have agnorisis, which is the moment in the story when the protagonist learns of his true identity or discovers the true nature of his situation. So in this case here, Macbeth is finally going to uh, hopefully come to the realization of who he really is. Is he a tyrant um, or not? Is he too ambitious? Um, or is he too self-absorbed and conceited to believe that nothing can defeat him? If you take a look then at the next terms, you have hubris, which is an extreme arrogance, and this is a very common tragic flaw for main characters. And then you have catharsis. It's the purging of the feelings of pity and fear that, according to Aristotle, occur in the audience of a tragic. So this term here has more to do with us at, or the audience. As we're watching the story unfold, um, how do we feel towards Macbeth? How, how, what kind of tension do we feel as we watch these events unfold in front of us? So these are just some of the terms um, that you need to uh, become familiar with. They are in the lesson folder for today, so you can take your time to read through them, as well as go back and see that video that I just showed you if need be. So if you have your script downloaded, um, I would like you to please follow along with me. We're going to pick up on page 60, which is the first um, scene of Act 5. I'm just going to 
make this a little bigger for us. And here we're going to have um, a doctor, a different doctor than the one that was with Macduff in the previous act. We have a doctor and we have a gentlewoman who is like a servant to Lady Macbeth. And Lady Macbeth is also going to be a part of this scene. So as we begin, I want us to think back to Act 1 and really all of the acts um, following that with this idea of the unnatural and the supernatural. We have the witches beginning this play and that is something that is very unnatural. It, it, it calls in this idea of the supernatural into the, the story. And I want us then to see how the doctor uses that word unnatural in this scene. I also want us to think back to um, how King Duncan died in his sleep and how even Macbeth said that he kind of envies King Duncan now that he's dead because he's able to sleep at peace, whereas Macbeth doesn't have any type of, of peace. I want to remind you of how Lady Macbeth reacted when she saw that Macbeth left King Duncan's chamber after killing him and left the daggers in the bedroom. She needed to go back to get the daggers and she was very upset that her hands were covered with blood. Um, and then I also want to draw your attention to that crazy scene where she um, asks these spirits to unsex her and she's calling in the night to take over. All of these things are going to come back to us in this particular scene, which is what makes um, Shakespeare such a great writer and can really help to bring the story full circle. So take a look at your screen. Again, I'm on page 60. I have here the doctor um, of the psych. In other words, he's, you know, he, he's a mental um, physician. And then we have the gentle woman. I have two nights watched with you, but can perceive no truth in your report. When was it she last walked? Since his majesty went into the field, I have seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed. Yet all this while in a most fast sleep. A great perturbation in nature to receive at once the benefit of sleep and do the effects of watching. In this slumbery agitation, besides her walking and other actual performances, what at any time have you heard her say? So here we find out that Lady Macbeth has been um, sleepwalking, and that is why the doctor has been called in. Okay. So I'm just going to write this here on the side. So Lady Macbeth has been sleepwalking. And so the gentlewoman is concerned. She says, listen, she gets up from her bed, she puts her nightgown on, she goes to her closet, she takes out a piece of paper, she folds it, she writes on it, she reads it, then she seals it, and she goes back to bed. So for a few days now, the, the gentlewoman, the, 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 you know, the woman in waiting, has uh, been noticing this from Lady Macbeth. Now, the doctor has been watching Lady Macbeth for two days, and she hasn't done anything. That, sir, which I will not report after her. You may to me, and tis most meet you should. Neither to you nor anyone, having no witness to confirm my speech. <laughs> Lo, you... So here, just notice that Lady Macbeth enters with that candle. Okay, holding a candle, and I'll talk to you a little bit about it uh, in a couple minutes. Here she comes. This is her very guise, and upon my life, fast asleep. Observe her. Stand close. How came she by that light? Why, it stood by her. She has light by her continually. It is her command. So I want us to um, note this in, um, in the script here, okay? And I'll use the modern translation. The doctor says, how did she get this candle? And the gentlewoman says, it stands by her bedside. She always has it to have a light next to her. This is her order. So I, it's important for me to note that apparently Lady Macbeth is afraid of the dark. And we need to figure out why. So if we kind of think about 
what darkness or dark represents, that could probably help us to understand why she uh, is afraid of the dark. We know that darkness can sometimes represent evil. Um, it could also sometimes represent something that um, that is unnatural or that we are afraid to uh, to witness or to see, right? So we know that unnatural things occur in the dark. So let's keep these things in mind as we continue with the scene. You see her eyes are open. Aye, but their scents are shut. What is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. It is an accustomed action with her to seem thus washing her hands. I have known her continue in this a quarter of an hour. Yet here's a spot. Hark, she speaks. I will set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. Out, damn spot. Out, I say. gentlewoman did not want to tell the doctor what she's heard Lady Macbeth say. But at this point, she doesn't have to. Lady Macbeth has pretty much just confessed to the murder of King Duncan. I didn't want to scroll down too much because I wanted us to be able to see both of these, um, you know, both of these pages at the same time. The doctor asks the gentlewoman, what is she doing now? Look how she rubs her hand. So I want us to, I'm going to highlight this because, again, it's important that Lady Macbeth is washing her hands. The gentlewoman says that she's seen her do that for almost or as long as 15 minutes. And Lady Macbeth says, there's still a spot here. And while Lady Macbeth is rubbing her hands, she calls out, come out, damned spot. Out, I command you. And then she goes and she says that hell is murky. And we'll talk about that. So before moving on, I think it's important then that we annotate some of this um, for us. And I'll, I'll put it over here. So Lady Macbeth believes she still has blood on her hands. And I'm going to make reference to this and bring you back to, um, I'm going to put reference, act one. And in parentheses here, I'm going to give us the, the page number of where we can find it in the script because I think it's important. So let me bring you back to, um, to page 21 in your, in your script so that we can see um, Lady Macbeth making reference to blood on her hands. So I just need to scroll up. I know it gets a little crazy when I do it this quickly. So these are some of the things that uh, we highlighted uh, and annotated. So here, and again, this is page 20 um, of the, the script. This is when she got upset at her husband for leaving the daggers um, I'm sorry for not leaving the daggers in the in the room and then here page 21 she goes back and she says my hands are as red as yours but I would be ashamed if my heart were as pale and weak so here she's saying look you know she's telling her husband look my hands are covered in blood because I had to go put the daggers back but um, that's okay what would really bother me is if I were as weak, if I were as afraid as you are, Macbeth. But now, again, we're talking about a contrast that we see in Act 5. I'll bring us back to where we are. She, she's really upset that her hands supposedly still have blood and she is commanding those damned spots to come out. And now, I highlighted here, hell is murky. She goes and, um, and she says, you know, hell is, 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 is horrible. It's, it's red. It, it's, it's crazy. 
and she says, nonsense, my lord, nonsense. So now she's talking to Macbeth, or she's making pretend that she's talking to Macbeth. So she's really recounting what happened. So she recounts, or I guess relives, um, the murder of Duncan. So she pretty much confesses to the crime um, while sleepwalking. Okay. You are a soldier and yet you are afraid. Again, this is how she was saying that she's, she would be ashamed to be as pale and weak as Macbeth. Um, why should you be scared when no one can lay the guilt upon us? But who would come... Who would have thought the old man would have so much blood in him? So this is then why she's rubbing her hands while she's sleepwalking. She remembers just how much blood there was um, when, they, when they killed King Duncan. So now the doctor has figured out that uh, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are responsible for King Duncan's death. Let's take a look at how th the scene continues. Do you mark that? A fife had a wife. Where is she now? What? Will these hands ne'er be clean? No more of that, my lord. No more of that. You mar all with this starting. Go to. Go to. You have known what you should not. She has. So the doctor now also found out that Macbeth is responsible for Lady Macduff's death. As Lady uh, Macbeth continues to sleepwalk, she makes reference to the Thane of Fife. And we know that the Thane of Fife is Macduff. Okay? And she says, the Thane of Fife had a wife. So this confirms that Lady Macduff is dead. Where is she now? What will my hands never be clean? So this again confesses to the crime. So Lady Macbeth confesses to the uh, murder of Macduff's, sorry, Macduff's wife. Okay. That's why her hands will never be clean. And she's speaking as if she's talking to uh, her husband. The doctor is afraid and he says, listen, to the servant, he says, you need to go. You should have never heard this in the first place. Oh, what she should not, I am sure of that. Heaven knows what she has known. Here's the smell of the blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Oh! Oh! oh. What a sound. So I'm sorry I keep stopping, but again, a very important scene. Here we see that Lady Macbeth feels really guilty for, uh, for what she did. There's guilt. In her, she says, "I nothing would ever clean, um, clean my hands of, of of the blood of these people." So Lady Macbeth feels guilty for the crimes. This is a huge contrast to um, the Act One, Lady Macbeth. Right. At first, she was um, very confident in herself. She said that if she swore that she would kill her own child, um, then she would go ahead and do it because she swore that she would. So at first, Lady Macbeth is, is um, again, very, very ambitious, very uh, evil. Um, and here you see that it, everything that she's done is really taking a toll on her. Is there? The heart is sorely charged. I would not have such a heart in my bosom for the dignity of the whole body. Well, well, well. Pray God it be, sir. This disease is beyond my practice. Yet I have known those which have walked in their sleep who have died holily in their beds. Washer. Well, sure. So the doctor is trying to keep some hope. He says, listen, I don't really know too much about what's going on, but I, I have seen patients who have sleepwalked, and they're not guilty of anything. So he's trying to see if there is a possibility that what Lady Macbeth is talking about is just an illusion rather than reality. Then that's a hint at one of our themes, right? Illusion versus reality. 
pants. Put on your nightgown. Look not so pale. I tell you yet again, Banquo's buried. He cannot come out on's grave. Even so. To bed, to bed. There's knocking at the gate. Come, 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 come. Give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed, to bed, to bed. So this echoes that uh, the scene right after Duncan's death, right? She tells her husband there is knocking at the door. Um, she didn't want anybody to know that they were still awake. So she says, put on your nightgown. We need to go to bed, to bed, to bed. And she also echoes what's done cannot be undone. Okay, so very important um, scene here. Will she go now to bed? Directly. Foul whisperings are abroad. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Infected minds to their deaf pillows will discharge their secrets. More need she the divine than the physician. God, God forgive us all. Look after her. Remove from her the means of all annoyance and still keep eyes upon her. So, good night. My mind she has mated and amazed my sight. I think, but dare not speak. Good night, good doctor. And that brings us to the end of the first scene. So the doctor says, uh, you know, is she going to go to sleep now? The gentlewoman says, yes, this is the end of her, her sleepwalk. And then the doctor says, evil rumors are going around. We know that people have been speaking all around Scotland that a lot of unnatural things have been happening. A lot of the questions that I've asked you as we've read the, uh, the, the play uh, point to this, right? The fact that it's very dark when it's supposed to be daylight. Um, the falcons, the birds, uh, all of these things seem to be very unnatural. So the doctor says unnatural acts will cause supernatural things to happen. So there's a hint that because of what Macbeth and Lady Macbeth have done, there has been a lot of evil things, a lot of unnatural things occurring in Scotland. Now again, if King James were watching this, he would be very pleased because he knows that only uh, a, a king, a rightful king, who has this ability to cure evil can come in and save the land. So going back to the script, the doctor says, people with guilty and deranged minds will confess their secrets to their pillows as they sleep. This woman needs a priest more than a doctor. God forgive us all. And then he tells the gentlewoman to remove anything that Lady Macbeth might use to hurt herself and to watch her as she sleeps. So very, uh, very important. The doctor is, is sure that Lady Macbeth is guilty of these crimes. But again, he's kind of holding on to, to, to the possibility that it can't. That's why she needs a priest. So what you're going to do is finish reading scene two on your own. I'm going to give you the audio version so that you can read it, and then you're going to answer some questions for these two scenes. So hopefully what you were able to see is how act five, scene one, mirrors a lot of the events that we saw in the beginning of the play and how drastic of a change we, um, we notice in the character of Lady Macbeth. And so then think about how ambition has really um, affected both characters. Here we have Lady Macbeth. In the next scene, they'll talk about Macbeth.